please ask me. We can discuss them later. So, uh, right. so uh, I will talk about some uh, some ongoing work on excited uh, martingales. Uh, so this is uh, with Alejandro Ramirez. and Mark Holmes. And the story is as follows. So uh, the, so first of all, what is the meaning of excitation? So uh, excitation uh, and excited random walks are processes that behave differently when certain conditions are met, so they become excited and do something unusual. And the first model of excited random walk, so so uh, the first model uh, that people have studied, as far as I know, is a random walk that has a drift uh, when it's at a new vertex. So uh, let's say you are on the line and you make plus minus one random walk. And when you're at a vertex that you've never visited before, you have some drift, but otherwise you have a simple random walk. Although you can do this not just in one dimension, but in any dimension. And uh, this was studied by Itai Benjamini and David Wilson in 2003. In 2003. And they had uh, the first initial results about this, in particular in high dimension, it's transient, and in one dimension, it's recurrent. And this has been studied quite a lot by a large number of people. So I will not try to uh, recover the whole history. Uh, sadly, Martin Zerner had, uh, had a lot of uh, contributions in this region. And uh, there's a survey by Cosigina and Zerner that people who are interested can look for. So eventually this is known to be, uh, to be transient in two dimensions or more and recurrent in one dimension yeah, as defined here, but there are many other variations that have more complex behavior. So this is uh, the excited random walk model. And then uh, you can ask what happens if you take a martingale. So uh, the random walk is now balanced. So uh, at each step, you have zero expectation conditions on the past. But still, the distribution could be different depending on, depending on your past trajectory, in particular, whether you're at a first visit to a site or at subsequent vertices. And so uh, another paper. Uh, Benjamini, Cosma, and Shapira introduced. So Benjamini, Cosma, and Shapira. I always have to check. So this is in uh, 2011 appeared. So and this is already the model that I will be talking about today. So. Uh, when you are at a new vertex, you move either up or down. And when you are at a, at a previously visited vertex, then you move either right or left. And this is uh, equal probabilities, half, half. So, so in particular, it's a martingale. So this is a two-dimensional random walk. And in particular, we can ask if it's recurrent or transient. So, so of course, it's not a Markov chain. Uh, if you just look at the, if you just look at the position of the particle, uh, it's a mark to make it a mark. So it's not a Markov chain. To make it a Markov chain, you need to look at the entire trajectory of the process. So uh, it's, you have to be a bit careful about what it means to be recurrent or transient. But for example, you can ask uh, whether it almost truly visits every vertex infinitely often, or it comes back to the origin infinitely often. And we can show that these two things are equivalent in this model, though this is not completely obvious. Um, so just to uh, 
let me show you some simulation of this. Uh, so this is the simulation of the first 100 walks of such a process. Uh, here you see just the trace, so it starts at zero, zero. Um, ah, okay, so I should have a, So, uh, yeah, so this is not an annotator, so I can't uh, point on this, but uh, imagine that uh, there's a nice uh, red dot floating over zero, zero. And uh, so, the, so this is a new vertex, so it moves vertically, it happened to move down. And in this case, it moved down three times, it got to minus three, zero, to zero minus three, and then it decided to move up, and then it was at a previously visited vertex, vertex, so it moved horizontally. So let me just switch here. So we started at zero, zero, you move down, you move down again, down again. Now you move up, and this is a vertex you've already been to, so maybe you move right or left, say you move right. And then uh, this is again a new vertex, so maybe you decide to move up, and then maybe you decide to move down, and again it's an old vertex, so you move right or left, maybe right, and maybe left, and maybe right again, and then down, and so on. So is that the process, and if there's anything unclear about the definition of the process, then uh, please say so now in the chat or otherwise, so that I can clarify. Okay, I see nothing in the chat. So, right, so this process um, messes around a bit in this uh, loop on the upper right, and at some point it starts to move to the left, and it makes its way uh, after 100 steps, it was at minus 10, minus 6. And uh, this is a very easy program to analyze, to, sorry, not to analyze, it's quite tricky to analyze, but it's very simple to simulate. So. Uh, so you can run this for a longer time and you can tell the computer to run for another 100 steps or another 10,000 steps. And this is what you get after 10,000 steps. And it doesn't show where the process is at the moment. I believe it's at the right tip. And you can run it for a bit longer. And this is after a million steps. So you get some nice picture which looks not completely dissimilar to simulations of a large number of simple random walk in the plane. Uh, this is another simulation, again, a million steps, uh, independent of the previous one. And so you might ask, what does this look like in the limit? What is the scaling limit of this picture? And this is uh, the long-term uh, goal is to understand uh, scaling limits of this picture. So, uh, scaling limits in the large range behavior. Um, so, uh, before I say a few more things about what uh, we know and believe in two dimensions. Let me mention a bit some of the literature that's been done in higher dimensions. It's, you can do this not just in two dimensions. And of course, there are many ways to generalize this to higher dimensions. So the, the way that most people have focused on is that you have some coordinates that are used on the first visit to a site and other coordinates on the subsequent visits. So here's a two. So on a new vertex, you move in D1 coordinates, and in an old vertex, in some D2 coordinates. So you have two parameters, D1 and D2, and they tell you, that, so the total dimension is D1 plus D2. And if you look just at the first D1 coordinates, then the movements are just a simple random walk. So in particular, if, you, if D1 is at least three, then this is trivially transitive because every time you turn your vertex, you move in this D1 coordinates and even the projection is transit, transient. So this is transient uh, if D1 is at least three or if D2 is at least three because just the projection is transient on those coordinates. And so, uh, so the same uh, paper that I mentioned above of Benjamini, Cosma, and Shapira, 
they show it's also transient if D1 is equal to D2 is equal to two. And they ask about the other cases. So a later theorem of uh, Perez, uh, Shapira, and Susie. So it's also transient if D1 is equal to one and D2 is equal to two. And the conjecture is that it's transient in the case of two one and recurrent in the one plus one dimensional case. And this conjecture is still open and I, unfortunately I will not uh, show you a proof of this today, uh, maybe next time. But uh, that is the situation for recurrence and transients on this model. Now there have been other, other related models uh, that people have studied. So uh, there's some work of Raymond and Shapira and some uh, work of Norris, Rogers and Williams about some related processes, uh, but not uh, this process in itself. Um, so why is this, uh, okay, let me skip some of the heuristics for, uh, for the higher dimensions. And uh, can I ask a question, Omer? Um, of course, if you if you if you allow, like if you if you make a model that looks like this, but in every case you have some probability to move in every direction, is it easier to study, or is it known what happens? So yes, so there are some uh, some case, some works on the uniformly elliptic case, say where you you have some probability epsilon of moving in the less common direction. And this is known to be recurrent in two dimensions. Uh, there is some more question. Is, is it also known? Uh, it, I don't know that it's been done. I believe this, this should be doable. But um, so uh, there is some work of Perez, Susi, and I think there's another co-author, I don't remember offhand who, where they, there's some very interesting results here as well. So they show, so you can ask uh, if you have different distributions, but always Martingale, always binding the bounded support, you can ask, can you make this recurrent in three dimensions? And and in three dimensions, it turns out that if you have two distributions, two different distributions, then it will always be transient. But in three dimensions, if you have three different distributions, it's possible to make it recurrent. Even. So you have some process that is, and uh, basically you want to say that with high probability, you move in the coordinate that is largest and small probability in the other coordinates. So if the probability is high enough, this becomes recurrent in three dimensions. And there's a lot of uh, theory going into this, but, but that will take a long time to describe. So I can look up the reference later if people are interested. Are there any other questions at this point? So uh, what can we say about this? Well, the as we already said before, if you look at the projection on the X coordinate, this is just a simple random walk, except with a time change. And similarly, the Y coordinate, it's just a time change of a simple random walk. So this is the first clear observation. So X and Y projections are just simple random walks up to a time change. Uh, which is given by the range. So if Rn is the total range, the total number of vertices, uh, so is the size of, uh, okay, so let me stay, define some notations. 
So S, uh, Sn is the process at time n, the walk, so Sn is Xn, Yn, and I can, you can write this for the entire path up to time n, path and Rn is the, the length of the path. So the, as a set, so, so this is size as a set. So it's the number of visited vertices and the number of vertical walks is just the number of, is just Rn. So uh, if we know Rn, we know the number of vertical steps and the number of horizontal steps is N minus Rn. So we can look at the range and So this is our uh, simulation from before. This is the range over a million steps. And what we can see here, okay, so it obviously increases, uh, seems to increase more or less linearly, but not quite. We have some regions here where it seems to be flat. And the, region, the reason we get this flat region, or more or, less, more or less flat, is that if it somehow finds itself in a region that's been already visited extensively, then it's going to be at all vertices almost all the time and the range will not increase so much. So uh, you have some uh, regions here, some time periods where it's in a region that's been visited quite a lot. Well, it's a bit hard to see the growth from this just single simulation. So we can do a thousand of them and take the average. So this was done uh, this morning. And well, the, the code was there before, but I just rerun it earlier since I didn't have the plot. So this is, uh, I guess, just a hundred. This is gen, just it's the sum of a hundred, so you need to divide by a hundred these numbers. So you see that after a million steps, the average range is roughly 80,000. So certainly, certainly much less than uh, what you get for a simple random walk, which is n over log n in two dimensions. Uh, so I see someone asked in the chat, what is Rn? So Rn is the number of vertices that have been visited in the first n steps of this process. So it's the size of the range. So uh, um, is this clear? Okay, I'll assume it is. Uh, so uh, once you have this plot, uh, this, uh, you look at it and you say, well, this clearly grows like some power of n. Uh, this clearly grows like n to the 0 0.78. Well, it's maybe not completely clear. Uh, you can, uh, the way I got this number is by calculating the expected range. So, so if you have just one vertex, um, geometrically, uh, Rn is just, uh, is just the, the number, it's just the expected size. So, uh, so this is the average range after n steps, uh, up to 45 steps. This is actually calculated and not simulated. So for n equals 45, we just look at every possible trajectory of length 45 and look at the number of vertices contained in it, uh, multiply by its probability and sum over all possible trajectories. So, uh, for, uh, so after 45 steps, the average length is about 25. So uh, again, a very simple program to write and, and with a bit more work, you can get it to, to go up to 45 in half a day on a small computer. And, uh, if, and this you can extrapolate. So uh, you can extrapolate this to find the polynomial growth rate of this. And if you do, if you plot this on a log-log scale and invert uh, the coordinates, so uh, you get something like this, and uh, what you see here is some, uh, it's approximately on a straight line, and you extrapolate the straight line to find the x interlay, the intercept on the y axis, and this is this red dot, which tells you what is the polynomial growth rate. So it's, it appears to be about 0 0.78. So, uh, so let me uh, state a conjecture based on these calculations and the simulations, says that the expected value of Rn 
is approximately is n to the alpha, where alpha is 0 0.7, let me write here an 8. Uh, I would maybe get 7.85, but, but I'm not terribly confident of this. So that's, uh, that's the model and what we believe about it. So what can we prove about it? So, so here's a theorem as mentioned with Alejandro Ramirez and Mark Holmes. We, so we can show that uh, with high probability and also in expectation, Rn is at least n to the four sevenths Well, no expectation with high probability. And it's bounded on the bar by n over log log n. Which is a bit disappointing in some ways. So neither of these bounds gives us the n to the 0 0.78. So we don't expect either of these to be accurate. The upper bound and the upper bound, some of you may have heard me speak about in the past. And the upper bound is a bit disappointing since it's even worse than the simple random walk. So the range is expected to be so, some power of n less than linear. And the simple random walk is n over log n. So, so you might expect uh, the range should be at least, so we should be able to show the range is smaller than the range of a simple random walk, but we cannot show this, at least not yet. And the lower bound, well, the lower bound uh, is what I'll talk about next. Uh, if people want, I can also say some things later about the upper bound proof, which is a bit more involved, but, uh, but again, uh, some people have heard me speak about this, so I want to start with the lower bound. Um, now, uh, JC, I... Uh, do you uh, take some short break uh, in this seminar in the middle or uh, just continue? Uh, not always, but if you want to take a short break, yeah, we can. Uh, okay, so I will go get a glass of water and... Yeah, sounds good. And yeah, so uh, the status of recurrence is still open, uh, so conjecturally recurrent in one dimension and transient in any higher dimension. We'll, we'll try to solve it while you take a glass of water. Uh, Yes. Um, okay, so I see a question from Pierre. Do we have a conjecture about the growth of the range in dimension three? There's and there's also um, a question uh, of Gabor. Uh, yes, I answered Gabor's question about That's the status right. of recurrence that it is still open. And uh, so I have not done simulations in dimension three. I would expect that it is, uh, that the range goes linearly. Um, but that would just be my first guess without thinking too heavily about it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, though perhaps uh, it even follows from the paper of Perez, Shapira, and Susie. Uh, well, it's not a, yeah, it's, it's not just a simple Markov chain. So, uh, so transients does not imply recurrence. And in the context of excited random walks, uh, there is, this is an issue. So, uh, so in one dimension, for example, a, a simple a, a random walk in one dimension, if it's transient, it has a, it must have linear range growth of the range also in positive speed, whereas these excited random walks uh, can have some uh, sub-diffusive transient behavior in some settings. So you do get some behaviors that's genuinely different from, from Markov chains. Um, yeah, so, but in any case, uh, to answer Pierre's question, so if you look in the paper of Perez, Shapira, and Susi, uh, the main method uh, that they use is some Martingale defocusing arguments. Uh, they argue that under certain conditions, they give up bounds on the probability that the Martingale is at a particular location at a particular time. And this upper bound, so could I 
they might be able to uh, also give bounds on the expected number of returns to a, v to a vertex and that could give a linear growth range. Ah, so Bruno is here and he says no. So, so uh, Bruno, do you, do you have a different conjecture about the range in three dimensions? Uh, well, okay, so Bruno can answer in the chat. Uh, but nice to have experts. So, sorry, by, by the time I figure out how to end your team. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so Bruno also conjectures the guess is linear in three dimensions. Um, okay, so, uh, so uh, let me uh, move on to uh, to uh, explaining how we get this n to the four seventh lower bound. So uh, here's the basic idea is the following. So why, uh, why is the Grange growing slowly? Uh, the reason the range is growing slowly is, and this is something you can even see oh, in this equation. We, we don't see your screen anymore, Omer. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, let me. Yes, so uh, this is a feature of the iPad that when you share your screen in Zoom, uh, if uh, at some point it goes into to sleep mode, so you close it, then it stops the screen sharing. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's actually a feature in the sense of feature and not a bug because it means uh, you can switch and do other things and people will not know that, that you're doing other things. But so if you look in this range, you can see that there are long intervals uh, in uh, horizontal levels that are completely visited. So long horizontal lines of fully visited vertices. And if the process happens to enter one of them, then it will just do a one dimensional random walk inside this interval until it reaches a new vertex and only then it's able to move vertically and exit. And uh, this is what slows it down. So to get a, an upper bound, we want to show that uh, we have such long intervals that, are, uh, that the random walk spends a lot of time in this long, completely visited horizontal intervals. Whereas to show that the range is large, we want to show that this does not happen. So, uh, um, ah, thank you. So, uh, so in order to show that uh, the range is large, we want to show that it does not get stuck too much in horizontal intervals. That's the basic obstacle that we need to overcome. So first of all, uh, maybe I'll say that trivially, the trivial upper bound, so the range of n is at least, at least in expectation, is at least square root n. Since if you look at xn plus yn, so this is a simple random walk. You just uh, either move by, by, by plus one or minus one in the sum of the coordinates. So the diagonal projection is a simple random walk and the range is at least square root n. So this is the, the benchmark that we need to, to beat to, to get something non-trivial. And in order to prove uh, a better bound, uh, let us look just at a single level now. So we have a single level of the process and I'm going to ignore everything that happens uh, either above or below this level. So, uh, so this is level, uh, this is some level L, uh, it doesn't matter what L is. And what happens if we look just inside this level? So initially the process is uh, somewhere else, it starts at zero, but at some point it will enter this level, maybe from below. So we get this uh, new point that's been visited and this is a new vertex, so it immediately exits and maybe it exits upward. So now the process is going to do some things, some things above and uh, we don't know what it does, but at some point it enters the level again at some, maybe at the same site, but maybe at some other site. And now we have, a, this again is a new site that hasn't been visited before, so we immediately exit and maybe we exit down and we do some stuff, but maybe we enter again. Maybe we enter again at this vertex that we already entered. And now we are at a vertex that's already been visited, so we move horizontally, maybe we move to the right. And now this is a new vertex, so we immediately exit. And then maybe we enter the level again, maybe we enter it again at this same vertex. 
And now that we are at this vertex, maybe we move left and we can actually move uh, between those two vertices any number of times until we reach either the, this one or this one. And maybe we end up moving to the left twice. So we are at this vertex again, a new vertex, so we exit. So this is what the process does uh, if you look at a single level. And uh, we consider the decomposition of this into visits. So uh, a visit is the is a time uh, from entering the level at some point A until you exit. Until we exit at a previously unvisited site. So we want to understand the length of these visits. And uh, our main goal at this point is to show that these visits are fairly short, so that you don't get stuck for a long time at the level. Oh. Um, so is it uh, clear what I mean by those visits? And if not, then do ask in the chat. And so, uh, so this is my, this is our objective. So uh, what can we say about the kth visit? So when you are at the kth visit, so you have the level and suppose you have this, the previously visited set, which contains a, uh, so these are so these are previously visited sites, and uh, we know that if you are in the eighth visit, then uh, the previously visited sets are exactly k minus one vertices that have been previously visited, because each visit you increase the size of the visited set by one. You enter at some site and. If it's new, you exit immediately. If it's not new, then you move until you find one new site and then you exit. So the so this is a total size is k minus one. So if we have a random walk that enters somewhere here, if it enters somewhere here, then it just exits immediately. If it enters somewhere inside one of these intervals, it's just going to move horizontally like a simple random walk until it reaches either either this point or this point, uh, either to the right or to the left, and then it exits. And this is an interval of length at most k. So the, the time uh, for a 1D uh, simple random walk to exit a set of side k, a set of size k, is at most k squared. Right, so the worst possible case, if it's an interval and you start at the center of the interval, it takes order k squared times. And that means that uh, if you look, so let's uh, introduce some notation. So, so tk is the length of the of kth visit. So the number of horizontal moves that we make during the kth visit. So we know that the expectation of tk is at most k squared. So the expectation of the sum, k goes from one up to m of tk is at most uh, m cubed. So this is uh, an easy bound. And uh, unfortunately, if we use this bound in the machinery that I will describe later on, this gives us uh, just a trivial upper bound, lower bound of square root n for the range. But we can improve this. So, uh, so with high probability, also in expectation, let's just write the expectation. The expectation of the sum k goes from one up to m of tk is at most, let's not worry about constant, m to the five halves. Now, uh, why does this lemma imply the n to the four sevenths bound on the on the range? So, so 
you know, prove that the range is at least 10 to the 4 sevenths. So suppose uh, you have a, suppose the range is R. So we know that the vertical steps are just a simple random walk with a time change uh, so that we made a total number of uh, R vertical steps. So we make R vertical steps. And that means that uh, vertically we move to height square root R. And each of the levels is visited. So this is just the local time of a simple random walk. So each vertex is, each level is visited on the order of square root R times. So we have uh, roughly square root R levels. Each is visited on the order of square root R times. Okay, so the levels near the top and the bottom uh, are visited even fewer times. Uh, that's going to be even better. That's not going to make a difference. And all the other levels have not been visited at all. And so uh, how much time has elapsed? What is n? And is the total time of the, all the visits to all the levels. So we know that in each level, in each uh, visited level, we apply the lemma with m equals square root r. So the total time spent is at most square root r to the power five halves by the lemma. And therefore the total time, the total time for the entire process is at most uh, we have square root r levels times square root r to the five halves, which you can rewrite as the range is at least n to the four over seven. So that's, so that's a, uh, heuristically, that's why the lemma gives the low bound of n to the four over seven. And uh, okay, so there are some uh, details here uh, to make this uh, precise. And to make this precise, you need also to argue that uh, these things are with high probability enough happen. That, so uh, there is some difference here between doing things in high, with high probability and in expectation, but let me not get into that right now. But that is, uh, but fundamentally that is why if you know that the, the, that the total time spent in this level is m to the five halves in the first m visits, that gives us the m to the four sevenths bound. Are there any questions? Uh, what's the mistake? Okay. Okay, so uh, so our goal, so our next goal is to prove this lemma to understand why the expected number of le the expected length of the first k visits is at most square root m is most m to the five halves. And uh, let's go back to the same picture I had uh, before of this level with the visited set. So we have the previously visited set. So if you enter the level at the center of an interval, so the, so you have the set of size k, okay, this one is the same. If you enter at the center of a log interval, then it's going to take you roughly k squared steps to exit. So uh, the, so the worst case, uh, this uh, it will take a squared and there's no way to improve on that. So we need to argue that this does not happen all the time. And unfortunately, and I'd like to, to say as little about the process as possible, except for what I see within these levels. So if uh, you enter a level at some positions A1 up to AM, then uh, if I tell you what is a1 up to am are, then you don't need to know anything about the process outside the level. 
because you can just restrict the process to the level, you are blind to everything else, and you enter at A1, you exit, you enter at A2, you move until you reach a vertex that you haven't visited before, and you exit, and so on. So you don't need to know anything about outside the level. We can now just focus on the one level and ignore the rest of the process. So if we are entered at position, say, 1 up to AM, we want to ask uh, what, uh, what is the total time to exit the level. And this is a random variable that depends on this a1 up to am. And if a1 up to am are all, are all equal, for example, so if a1 up to am are all, let's say, zero, then I claim that actually tk, the kth visit, is on the order of k squared. And why is that? This is uh, actually uh, the fundamental version of a process that's been studied a lot uh, of internal DLA. So you, you enter, uh, you put a vertex at zero, and you move, you do a random walk until you reach a new site. And then, you, you, then this particle is no longer relevant. And then you put another particle at zero. It uh, again uh, does a simple random walk until it reaches a new site and stops. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, this is internal DLA, and the range is going to grow roughly like a symmetric interval of length k, and so you always start at near the center of the interval. So you start near the center of an interval, and therefore it takes roughly k squared steps. Uh, but uh, this is not something that can happen. You cannot have uh, m times enter the level at the same position. And the reason is that you can only enter the level twice at every position, because you only make one vertical move from each vertex. So uh, if you have the level, you can only enter it once from below and once from above at the level. But, that's the, but then you can never enter it again at this location. If you are here or here again, then you will move horizontally. So you can only enter twice at each location. But this is still not enough. Uh, if A1 uh, and so on uh, are, let's say, you enter twice at 0, then twice at 1, then twice at 2, and so on, then you get an interval. It's no longer symmetric. It grows, uh, it will grow slightly more to the right, but still you will enter at uh, roughly at the center of the interval, say in the middle to the middle half of the interval. And, uh, and still you get that uh, we still get that the expectation of tk and even the actual time is on the order of k squared. So in order to improve on this, we want to claim that, that it's impossible to, uh, to always enter near the center of the interval. And in order to do this, uh, we use the fact that actually you are not going to be able to enter twice at each location. And why is that? Well, at each vertex, you only make one vertical move. And let's look at the level just below our level. So we have all those vertices, and from half of them, you're going to move up into our level, and from half of them, you're going to move down away from our level. So if we have a point here, So if we have this point here, so we have the level, the vertex below it and above it, the vertex below, if it's visited, then uh, with probability half, you will go up. And the vertex above, if it's visited, with probability half, you will go down. So the number of times you enter at each point is, is on average one, at most. Maybe not all of them are used. So uh, on average, you enter at most once at each location. And more precisely, it's at most, uh, you get a binomial to one half bound for the number of times you enter at each location. And these are independent between different locations in the level. They are not independent between one level and other levels, but they are independent across the level. So now if you have some, uh, if you have some interval of length k, 
let's see. Okay, larger. So it's impossible to always enter near the center. And if you try to enter as close to the center as possible, then what will happen is that uh, you will maybe enter once here and then again here, and then maybe once here, and then maybe here, and then maybe here, but some locations you will never enter at all. And they will only be occupied by the horizontal moves. And, and the, the, the difference between the length of the interval and the number of entries is the sum of binomials with mean one is on the order of square root k at most. So I'm going a bit fast since I, there's not too much time. And how much time do I have actually? Um, yeah, maybe if you can take five more minutes, that would be great. Okay. So, uh, so the expected number of, uh, so the, so if you just try to enter the vertex as close to the, the, this interval as close to the center as possible, so if we, Uh, near the center, then what you find is that you actually enter almost at the end of the interval. You'll enter at the distance at most square root k from the interval. So you enter a distance square root k at most from the end. So you will actually enter at some position here where this is square root k at most. And you have almost all the interval on the other side. And if you start near the end of an interval, a distance square root k, so now the expected time, so now the expected time to exit is at most k to the three halves. If you have an interval of a uh, if you have a vertices, distance a to the right and b to the left, it's a times b, the expected time for a simple random walk to exit this interval. So it's at most k to the three halves. So now if we say that uh, the kth visit is k to the three halves, then, uh, so at least uh, at some heuristic level, I hope uh, I'm convincing you that the expected, uh, so the expected length of the kth visit is k to the three halves, so the first m visits are k m to the five halves. So m of tk is at most m to the five halves. Now, uh, this is not quite uh, the end though. Uh, this is not quite precise because who tells you that you're always entering as close to the center of the interval as possible? Maybe, maybe you enter at some locations and build up a large interval that's completely visited and only then you enter at the center. So, so you have some, uh, some possible entry that you've uh, reserved to later on. And now you enter at some position near the center of a large interval and you get a large time. So there's one more ingredient uh, that's uh, one more big ingredient that I haven't mentioned to make this precise. And this is the abelian property. So, uh, so what is the abelian property? It's been studied in the context of the abelian sandpile and other uh, related models. And the idea is as follows. So if we have M particles that are going to enter, and instead of just have, thinking of it as one particle entering position A1, then at A2, then at so on up to AM, we can think of having M particles entering at positions A1 up to AM, and each particle moves until it reaches a site that has not yet been occupied then it occupies it and leaves. So the abelian property says, it tells you that the sum of uh, Tk does not depend on the order of entries. So if you enter at A1 and then at A2, or at A2 and then at A1, you will take the same number of steps to exit. And to make this precise, you need to uh, think that at each vertex you have, uh, you have, from the beginning, you have written a sequence of instructions, uh, right, left, right, 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 left, right, left. 
and uh, each particle uh, looks at the next unused instruction and follows it. And the abelian property says that uh, you can put the particles in one order or in another order, or even it's continuous or other scheduling process. And it always, uh, and always the same uh, number of, uh, each vertex will be visited the same number of times even. So in particular, the total number of uh, steps taken are going, is going to be the same. And once we have this, uh, then uh, things become much simpler because we can just say, well, we can assume that, uh, the, that the level is entered from left to right. A1, uh, A1 is smaller than A2, is smaller than A3, and so on. And now this implies that with very high probability, uh, the kth entry is at most square root k from the, from the tip of the occupied set. And, uh, th and then everything can, make can be made precise. So, uh, so there's a lot more uh, going into making these things precise. Uh, you need some large deviations for uh, estimates for the times, and you need some, uh, some estimates on how many times you can enter the level because the level is infinite. So in some place on the level, you will have some region that you are able to enter twice at each location. So you need to also argue that uh, this does not happen anywhere near the origin and you don't find them. So there's all sorts of additional technical points that I'm not covering at all, but, but I think this is a good place to stop. So uh, thanks again uh, for the invitation and... Thank you very much, Romer. So I will also uh, give everyone the ability to amuse themselves so that we can give you a round of applause. So I think we should... <laughs> Thank you.